Welcome to our Superstonk AMA with Robbie Ferguson, the president and co-founder of Immutable. Thank you so much for doing this. For those who don't know you, why and how did you create Immutable and why GameStop? Yeah, so growing up, I was a massive gamer. I have thousands of hours across League of Legends, RuneScape, Neopets, MapleStory, uh, really loved things with economies. And I remember when I was a kid, my brother and I used to share a RuneScape account, which was against the terms of service. Uh, and one day I went on his account into the wilderness with full dragon armor and I lost all of it against the PVP art. And I felt so bad that that night I spent my pocket money buying in-game gold to buy him back his armor. That went well until two days later when I was banned permanently. And three months later, Jagex rolled out in-game bonds where they officially allowed you to buy in-game gold, but as long as Jagex got their clip. So I think it was pretty clear early on just how raw a deal gamers were getting when they were spending real money and effort on in-game experiences, assets, and items that they never held any rights to. And then over the past eight to nine years, I've been building technology startups as a software engineer with my brother and with my co-founder. I've been in crypto since 2014, uh, but I became really passionate when Ethereum came out. I uh, became pretty obsessed, actually, around how this would transform the future of finance. But it wasn't until 2017 when the first ever NFT came out in the form of a crypto punk that we looked at it and we said, hey, this NFT is actually the standard by which we can have digital property in the internet or with digital goods. And so we built the first ever multiplayer game on a blockchain. It was called Etherbots. All of the logic was on chain. Uh, so it'll cost you thousands of dollars to play a game today. We learned pretty early on what should be on chain versus off chain. But fundamentally since then, we've been obsessed with this mission of how do we make Web3 games real? How do we deliver more value for players and shift an industry which is very, very exploitative to one where the incentives between publishers and players are aligned. And that's fundamentally what things come down to. Uh, so today, Immutable is more than 300 people worldwide. Uh, we've raised more than $300 million US uh, off Tomasic, Tencent, some of the biggest gaming and, and sort of crypto names in the world. And every part of Immutable is focused on how do we make the highest quality Web3 games and empower hundreds of millions of players to have true digital property rights. And I think this is where we actually differentiate from a lot of other players in the space and a lot of other people making NFTs. We really don't care about expensive or luxury, you know, collectibles or NFTs. I think they're cool. Uh, I think they're exciting and, and move the space forward. But the way this becomes mainstream and the way we actually change players' rights is by taking everyday items that you win or earn or buy inside video games and ultimately everything and turning them into tradable assets that you have proper property rights over. And that's when we start to see things being traded for a buck or 50 cents and, you know, hundreds of millions and billions of these every day. And today, Immutable is the only platform where you can mint a billion NFTs and pay zero dollars uh, in gas fees, which is really, really significant for the games that we work with. Uh, why GameStop? I think it's pretty obvious. You know, I, I think two things. The first is that obviously we're a protocol. So we empower games and, and customers to have the best possible experience when they build or trade in Web3 games. But we need exceptional marketplaces uh, and, and partners to work with to actually create user experiences for people to use. Uh, and GameStop, we believed in for a few reasons. The first is they built an incredibly credible team, uh, you know, under the leadership of, of Matt Francis as uh, the CTO who came over from an Amazon exec uh, and, and, and the team that is built underneath there. The second is their history in gaming. They have 50 million retail customers. I mean, pretty much everyone watching this video would have gone into a GameStop or an EV Games if you're an Aussie as a kid and bought games. And so there's huge sort of uh, communal consciousness uh, and connectivity with gamers um, at a core values level and also at a brand level. And the third is it has one of the fiercest and most powerful digital communities in the world today. And that is fundamentally actually one of the core characteristics of Web3 is it allows communities to actually enact change because these are the people who can go in, you know, lobby games to say, hey, this is the standard we now expect for property rights. Uh, these are the communities that can say, become the audience and the value for a lot of the games building on Immutable. Immutable in the last three months have won more games or onboarded them onto the platform than in the last two years aggregate. And a good reason for that is that 
all of these games are so excited to tap into the value that GameStop and GameStop's community is going to bring them in terms of people playing the games, people providing them uh, support on socials, people building a community that is ultimately creating this brand of, hey, we think gamers deserve more rights. And this is the expectation that we're going to be setting. And every previous major shift in technology where players or users have had more rights has come from a resetting of an expectation and a disruption of incumbents. And I think that's the exact same process that's going to happen for Web3 gaming. So a long introduction, but I think it's been a big journey. Uh, and we are now seeing, you know, the, the actual huge consciousness of, of gaming and VCs in gaming shift towards Web3 as what they believe the future will be. So Immutable X is a leading layer two Ethereum scaling solution that is coming soon to the GameStop NFT marketplace. A lot of people want to know when is soon. Yeah. So obviously, as you know, I can't share the exact date. <laughs> Uh, but what I can say is that the first core step was to have the wallet integrated, which is now done. The rest is, is mostly sort of uh, finishing up the integration and, and some paperwork. So it's truly not going to be too long. Uh, and we have a ton of content planned uh, for the launch. Obviously, upon launch, every single game and every single order on the immutable protocol will become available on, on GameStop's marketplace. So um, there's going to be a ton of stuff to interact with or, or, or trade with or play with more meaningfully from day one. Do you have any insight into how GameStop is progressing so far with their grant milestones? Yeah, uh, so I think this is really exciting. Obviously, the, the next milestone comes at the, the marketplace launch. Uh, and after that, it, the goal is to hit over $3 billion in, in volume um, in order for them to sort of uh, unlock the rest of the milestones, which is how we approach and the foundation approaches long-term incentive alignment. Um, the other exciting thing is that uh, GameStop, obviously a public company, has, has certain sort of policies regarding the holding of tokens on its balance sheet. Any tokens that they end up wanting to, to sell over these milestones, we've actually already found uh, with the foundation long-term sort of buyers to match the supply and demand on. So none of that will be hitting the market, um, which is, is sort of excellent for all parties as well. So why Web3 Gaming? Yeah, so fundamentally, the majority of gaming revenue today comes from gamers spending money not on buying the Call of Duty box set of Modern Warfare 2, but instead on buying the skins inside Fortnite or the coins inside Candy Crush. In fact, $100 billion every year is spent on in-game items and players have zero property rights to this. And this is not a myth that we're talking about i mean uh even today you know blizzard shut down a huge amount of value for, for diablo purchases hundreds of thousands of dollars no longer have any utility and, and gamers are leaving this game warzone uh controversially said that none of your assets will be used in warzone 2 we have counter-strike go by steam which was one of the largest gray marketplaces in the world for end game items decided to right as we were building the company shut down and trade lock assets they can only be traded once per week uh, for, for CSGO skins. And hundreds of millions of dollars of player value was lost. A business, Opskins, third party marketplace, worth $300 million went bankrupt because of this decision. So it is truly the largest asset class in the world where people spend an enormous amount of money and time, and most importantly, have their identity invested in it, where the creators of this economy have complete impunity. I mean, at least with currencies and, and the Fed, they have these levers, but they can't shut off people's access uh, at a whim. They can't take away people's funds or suddenly make them no longer valuable. And this is why philosophically, I think it's so important is that the world is only going to become increasingly more digital. Games are only going to become more important. Gaming is already bigger than music, movies and TV combined, and it's growing at 10% year on year. It is becoming the dominant form of entertainment through which everything else is interacted with. And it's important that in 30 years, in 50 years, the physics of this world, the digital property rights are real, that they're decentralized and players and users have actual rights to this and that it's not owned by Meta and they're not charging 52.5% on every transaction. So I guess that's the philosophical lens. Um, the, the more kind of commercial lens and, and the inevitability lens is that gaming has seen a huge amount of shifts over the past two decades. It's gone from the point where you would buy a box set of a game for $80 to you download the game for free and monetize through in-game transactions. 
to now in China, mobile game companies literally advertise a carbon clone of the game, say Clash Royale. And they say the reason you should play it is their in-game items are cheaper than their competitors. So it's clearly a race to the bottom. The only way to create actual meaningful progress is to switch up the paradigm from I'm a games company that's continuously trying to extract maximal value and the best customer acquisition costs of, of users to be one where their incentives are fundamentally aligned with players. And the example I always give is many people play with Magic Gathering cards or Yu-Gi-Oh cards growing up, where you trade these cards for a buck or 10 bucks or 500 bucks if they're particularly rare. And Magic the Gathering every year has to make all the cards less valuable in order to make revenue off new sets. Their monetization model will be completely different if they could take clips on secondary sales. And the estimated secondary market cap of MTG cards, physical cards, is $20 billion. So suddenly you could have a model where their incentive is to grow this economy over time in line with players' interests, to create new worlds and experiences that use these assets rather than deprecating them with every game in order to maximize forward revenue. And I think this is a model that is incredibly powerful uh, and fundamentally a, a, a more sustainable kind of economic approach for both players and publishers. So it's an inevitable trend. It's better for everyone. Uh, and it's one that I think establishes future property rights in the right way to build out essentially where humanity is going, which is mostly or fully to virtual. Well, those are good reasons why. Um, how much trading volume do you envision GameStop's marketplace doing with Immutable? How is the Immutable gaming pipeline? Yeah, so I, I think this actually brings up a really good point, which is if you look at NFT volume over the past four months with the crypto bear market, it has been smashed, right? PFP projects are down 80, 90%. There's no shying away from that. What is not down 80, 90% are games. In God's Unchained, our that transaction volume is only around down around 10 to 15 percent and the reason is people don't trade these cards because ethereum is four thousand dollars or a thousand dollars they trade them because they want the utility of buying a card to use in a deck they want the experience of showing off a unique or rare card and that's why the average trade value is a dollar and so that's why our mission immutable is focusing on long-term utility driven value these games will dwarf collectibles and luxury volume uh, as this world expands because the audience is in the hundreds of millions or the billions, not in, you know, 10 million in enthused luxury buyers of NFTs, which as I said is awesome. I have nothing against that, but it's not what is going to be the Trojan horse that makes Web3 mainstream and that restores digital property rights to billions of people. Now, I think GameStop is in a perfect position to capitalize on a huge portion of the future volume of games which is by far going to be the biggest volume of, of NFTs and Web3 trading volume in the future. And you mean, if, you, if you just look at the stats, we have a $3 billion milestone. So the goal is for, for Immutable and GameStop to collectively achieve on the GameStop marketplace more than $3 billion of volume uh, for gaming assets, which right now would make us by far the largest source of gaming volume by over an order of magnitude. Um, so really excited about that. Our pipeline is insanely strong, as I said, We've won more games in the last three months than in the previous two years combined. Our go-to-market team has gone from seven people in January to over 75 people today. And importantly, it's not just us selling a dream to these people. We build two games in-house on Web3. We build a mobile game. We build a desktop game. So we're at the call face of knowing how do you make a successful, sustainable, and better for players Web3 game. And that's the reason we're actually able to help the games that build with Immutable rather than just sign them up on the platform and, and let them go do their thing and, and have a high rate of failure. Uh, so that's why we did the deal. That's why we're really excited about this and, and super bullish on, I think, the long-term utility volume that's going to be coming out of this marketplace. Can we expect anything on the GME marketplace from other high-profile immutable partners like Marvel or Disney? Yeah, so nothing I, I can share publicly that we haven't already shared, um, but you can bet that A, all of the IP um, that's on our global order book will be available from Marsney or, or Disney or, or DC Comics, um, which is currently building uh, on Immutable today via Colex and, and via BV. Uh, and also a ton of Web3 and AAA content. So what I can share is that two AAA gaming partners 
uh, are already agreed to be building on Immutable. I can't show the exact names yet, um, but we'll be announcing these over the next three to six months. Uh, so really excited about that. And that is alpha that I have not shared anywhere else uh, first. And there's also a bunch of games that have already announced. I mean, we had uh, Alluvium, which just did the largest Web3 gaming sale of all time on Immutable. $72 million in a weekend. And the thing I love about this team is that they are doing Web3 completely right. They understand how you can actually reinvent from category up what a incentive aligned game looks like. 100% of Alluvium's revenue goes to the token holders of ILE, right? And, and, and this is not profit. This is not something they can like calculate with EBITDA. It is literally 100% of revenue. And that's why they're able to do such huge sales. That's why they're able to build such a huge community because they're building this collective effort to build an ecosystem uh, and a game over decades rather than something which has exploited it. And I think that showcases a lot of power of that today. We have World Wide Web, which is a, a blue chip AAA uh, web free game, not AAA not in the con uh, conventional sense, which just announced they're building on Immutable. We have um, Wag Me Games, uh, Immortal Game, Ember Sword, Planet Quest. There's a ton of stuff out there that's going to be coming out either playable in the next six months or as announced uh, that we're really excited to share. We got so many questions about AAA games, so that is super exciting. <laughs> um, okay, so NFT coupons. One Actually, I, I'll, look, I'll, I'll add on to that, which okay, is <laughs> we're excited about AAA games, but I'm actually more excited about mid-market studios. So market caps between, say, $50 million to a $1 billion. Because the, character, like, the characteristic difference of AAA games is that generally they're high-budget studios, they're, they're very high-quality games, um, but the biggest movers in Web3 are not going to be the biggest games companies in the world in the next three to four years because their risk model doesn't really make sense to go all in on this stuff. They'll explore, they'll experiment. There are some studios looking at it really heavily, like obviously Maple Story um, is is kind of uh, heavily looking at Web three, but and and that's public. Um, but what is the difference is that Web three has finally made equality for studios who are building exceptional games but don't have a half billion dollars in marketing budgets so that they can go to market with the exact same firepower that these large studios do. Because now they have the benefit of, and the, the, essentially the most powerful growth lever of all time, which is if you give players skin in the game, they will stick around, they will love your game and they will share your game more than anything else. The, the viral coefficient on this is insane. And you can build growth levers that you're rewarding people for actually building the ecosystem. So suddenly, Instead of spending a billion dollars on Google ads to promote your game, you can just spend it on a real value-backed asset economy and the incentives are there for it to grow organically, which is how by far the biggest games in the world have grown. Pokemon Go is all literally viral, like word of mouth um, sharing to reach a, you know, uh, the, the amount of players that it did within, I think, like five or six days. And these studios between 50 million to a, a, a billion dollars are the ones that are saying, this is how we win and compete with the biggest games companies in the world. We're going all in on Web3, and I mean, Gabe Layden, right? The founder of Machine Zone just raised $200 million for a Web3 game. There has never been more capital poured this quickly into any category of Web3 or pretty much any category in the entertainment space in the history of the world. So to say that Web3 game is now an experiment is to ignore where all of the best talent in the space is going and where all of the large VC checks in the space are going. Nice. Um, so NFT coupons, one in game and redeemable in store or online can be possible with NFTs. Can the GameStop and Mutable X partnership deliver this? Of course. So one of the things I'm really excited about is hybrid NFTs. Uh, people call them digital. I think that word is gross. Uh, but <laughs> the ability to buy a physical item and then have a corresponding digital asset. Well, likewise, a digital asset, which is redeemable for physical, is a really powerful A, onboarding flow. So imagine you go and, and suddenly all of these stores, every single person who goes into them doesn't even need to know what a, an NFT is. They can buy their, you know, physical asset or, or, or their digital asset. And suddenly they have, you know, this value. And they're like, well, why wouldn't I claim this NFT? And that way we can onboard very quickly tens of millions of retail users into the value of Web3. Um, and, and that's really exciting with things like, you know, the GameStop wallet as well. Uh, the partners building on Immutable today have actually already done massive distributions through retail stores. So Colex has already done distributions through more than uh, 200 target stores in the US and already worked actually with, with GameStop in a different capacity. Um, so we already have the infrastructure to say, offer to the games building on Immutable. Why don't we make 
you know, millions of, of physical cards or collectibles that we can put inside stores and people can get this hybrid collectible. So I think it's actually a massive opportunity. It's, it's part of the reason I'm so excited to be working with GameStop. Nothing specific to share, but this is absolutely uh, something we'll be looking at very closely. Very cool. Um, well, I guess you already kind of answered this. Are you getting feelers from larger game studios about integration with Immutable? Yeah, so I, I think I did already cover this. Um, we're seeing huge interest, I think, out of pretty much most of the top AAA studios in the world. As I said, they're not going to go 100% in, but they absolutely are thinking about, well, hey, this is the next big distribution shift in gaming creation and monetization. This is probably more major than the shift to free-to-play, which when free-to-play was initially you know, created, there was massive backlash from gamers, and it ended up becoming this inevitable trend and one that was probably much better for them. Um, the same for, for social. And I think this is the first time that the shift is one that is fundamentally able to change the incentive structure because it, everything comes down to incentives. If the incentive is create revenue uh, with, with incentive misalignment, then you will have extractive value. You will have mobile gaming, which tries to get every marginal dollar out of users. If the incentive is actually the way you make money is by creating a long-term economy where the interest of the player and the interest of the creator of the game are the same, then suddenly you have a, a very beautiful model that the most successful games will actually be doing the best actions for players. Uh, and so I, I think we're seeing this kind of emerge with, with AAA games. Um, but as I said, the vast majority of uh, these successes over the next two years will come from mid-market studios, which still have big budgets, 50, 100, 200 million dollars, but are 100% committed to experimenting with Web3 and using that to create these massive games. What game launches are you most excited about on IMX? Look, I, I, won't, I won't single out too many. I've already named some names. Um, what I am most excited about is the fact that every single deal we do, we very consciously look at, right? So Immutable is a completely self-serve platform. Anyone can build on us and they can build on us very simply using essentially Stripe-like APIs. That's one of the things that differentiates us from every other blockchain or platform out there where you have complex smart contracts you have to use. We think if this is gonna go mainstream, it must be ridiculously easy for any game developer or any business to actually build on it. But uh, what we're seeing at the moment is people building on that self-serve pipeline who are massive. So Aglet um, just hit 4 million monthly unique users. So one of the biggest Web3 games in the world. And they built on immutable self-serve. Obviously we found out about them once they launched and now we work really closely with the team, uh, which is awesome. But I think that's the power of what we built on, on the self-serve side. Uh, for the games that we meet, like actively work with, they go through a very careful process where we basically have an internal ventures uh, and tokens team, which very closely looks at you know the team, the funding, the game they're building, the genre, the economics, and says, hey, we're excited about this game. We're going to put a lot of effort in, in kind of trying to partner with them, trying to help them uh, with, with economic success. And that's because pretty much all of the volume in Web3 gaming is going to come from the top 10, 20 games over the next couple of years. Gaming is very hit driven or power law driven, which means that the biggest game will do more volume than the rest of them combined. The next biggest game will do more volume than the rest of them combined. What we want to do is find those 20 winners and help them succeed as much as possible, which is why, you know, we, we have huge capacity to, to work with games, but all of these are ones that are exciting. They're all ones where they're actually doing things that are better for players rather than short term, you know, scammy or, or, or revenue seeking collectibles projects where honestly they're not things you can grow over years and years and have be a valuable partner of the company and um, so pretty much every game that we've announced i'm excited about and um, there's obviously some some massive ones ember sword alluvium planet quest uh worldwide web that have come out and some really really big ones to announce very soon um but i you know i, I could speak to to the genre and, and style of any game building on us and be excited about it what are Immutable's values when it comes to fostering in-game economies? Are there principles that guide how you determine the supply, staking, or release schedule of in-game assets or currency? Yeah, so I think this is actually one of the core IP values of Immutable and why we are winning the gaming flow that we do today. And that's because every other platform in the ecosystem is, you know, build these teams, but they don't actually know what it takes to build a successful, sustainable web through economy. We do because you know we, we build two of them internally. We publish many more of them. We just hired Justin Hulog and, and Jennifer Poulsen, 
who ran Riot Games Asia and publishing for Riot Games Asia to, to build this studio in addition to, to Chris Clay, um, who ran Magic the Gathering Arena. And our philosophy is pretty simple, which is it has to be sustainable. You can't have growth that is fueled by things that will sort of break the economy at a certain size, as we've seen with multiple of the sort of um, flash hit economies in, in Web3 gaming. And we have an entire team, so literally a, an eight person team in our, our tokens team, which does sort of full time consulting and services offering, plus a 35 person customer success and integrations team. And all these people do is think about how can we help make sustainable economies, um, sustainable, fungible token designs, uh, compliance to make these games as good as possible. And if I, if I share kind of one, one simple thing, it's that, you know, every asset that you create is actually a, a, a inflation on the supply of that economy. And so it has to be paid for somehow. You have to somehow as a game be able to back the creation of these new assets with more demand. Uh, and that's why it's so important that every time you give away an asset, it's actually driving behavior in that game that you want to, whether it's increasing retention, increasing uh, like viral coefficients. The goal is to switch the billion dollars you spent on Google Ads to the value that players can keep, but still have that be measurably meaning that there's gonna be long-term economic demand for that game. We're all excited for the future of Web3 gaming, but what is something that currently keeps you up at night? What would you consider a pain point Immutable is working through that you hope investors and early adopters are aware of to avoid shock or disappointment as games launch? Yeah, I think uh, one of the main things is obviously that there is no mainstream Web3 game today. The biggest is kind of maybe like three, four million users. Uh, and the reason behind that is just that the investment in these games has happened in the last 12 months. Games take longer than 12 months to release, particularly when it's category creation and you're doing economics from scratch. And that's why our goal is games should just build good games. We're here for everything else. You can come to us and we'll solve your needs around, hey, this is how you do uh, a proper in-game economy. This is how you do community and, and marketing. This is how you actually create the right balance of sharing value. So I think that's key. But really where we have to get to, and it will happen in the next two years, is a game that has 100 million users where people play this game and download it without ever knowing what a wallet is, what a private key is, what Web3 is, but they just experience the value of being able to have true ownership, of being able to have scarce and tradable ownership of, of property, and most importantly, having the right incentives between the creator of that game and, and, and themselves. Um, so that is everything we're pushing towards. The North Star of Immutable is how many, you know, how do we get to 100 million unique traders on the Immutable protocol and then a billion? Uh, and so the vision really is get this as mainstream as possible with content that is fundamentally better for players. For indie developers building their own Web3 games that want to utilize the power of NFTs to build community and value for their players, what's your advice? Yeah, I mean, A, come to us and then <laughs> we can help. But B, I think, is just sh like share value. Like the whole goal of Web3 is you can own a piece of a much bigger pie by sharing that pie and by redesigning the incentives of, of how that pie grows rather than sort of doing it the hard way, which is trying to build a business which is fundamentally rent extractive or value extractive at every stage. It's why the foundation made it so that over 60% of immutable supply is purely for building the ecosystem over the next decade. And every single grant we do is, is milestone driven, is long-term incentive alignment um, in order to A, sort of protect token holders, uh, but also B, build this long-term in incentive alignment. It's why we have, you know, one of the largest war chests essentially um, in, in crypto today for helping games uh, choose where to build in Web3. And so at the core of it is how do you design your incentives and build the community in the right way? Um, and that's why I say, like, look to examples like Alluvium. Every single decision they make is made for the benefit of the community. And if you follow that path, you will end up building an ecosystem where people trust you, people will grow it for you, and you will end up ho like owning, you know, a very profitable piece of a much bigger pie where the incentives are shared. Um, and that's why I'm actually personally so excited about user-generated content. Um, and we've seen the biggest growth in in games categorically over the last two decades being UDC based platforms. So Roblox, obviously creator engines, Unity and Unreal. And this gave some portion of value to players uh, and to creators, right? Roblox said, hey, we'll allow people to build games where they can monetize and create economies inside our platform. Web3 takes that to the extreme. 
It says, we'll give you 100% of the value for assets you create. You can have permanent royalties that, you know, immutable guarantees these royalties no matter where they're, they're, they're traded. Um, you can have someone sell an asset inside Alluvian and be bought on the GameStop marketplace. And so I think this is actually really key as well, which is how do you create something where uh, the, the community can generate value and catch that value and create an overall larger pie? How do you respond to people who say microtransactions and pay to win do not make games better? Some people would argue that adding ownership into the equation makes that environment better, but does not fix the overall quality issue. Yeah, I think I think it's been a, a, a big issue. Um, it, it is interesting because there's two genres of games like Asian uh, games in particular often embrace pay to win um, as a phenomenon and, and, and they don't mind it. It's kind of like how you just create new interesting meta designs. Um, and I think Web3 can bring value to that, where these people can pay to own a guild or run a guild and people can receive value from that who don't want to pay, but instead want to play in the game. And I think that's actually really cool, allowing people to play these different roles. But look, fundamentally, I, I think the growth of this industry is going to come from games which embrace, you know, still the same core principles of how do you make a, a game fun. And that means it has to be balanced. It can't be someone can just beat you because they, they bought something awesome. Um, so all of those principles are going to stay the same. The core driver is just now, no matter what genre of game it is, it, it could be you know a, a game where you can buy power. It could be a game where you can only buy skins. Everything is ownable. Everything is fair. And economic value is being created by and shared with the same people who are, are, are generating that value. Um, so I think it's it's... It's fundamental to whatever genre. Obviously, there'll be there'll be specific differences as people build things. Do you have any opinions on the mobile gaming scene and their current predatory practices? So the mobile gaming scene is probably the most uh, value extractive out of any industry in the world right now, because really the goal is just how do you optimize acquisition cost and then spend uh, and put people in buckets where they have to spend more and more in order to compete with others. And I think what web3 will do it'll do two things the first is it'll allow games with better player centric designs to compete on a performance marketing basis with these games because instead you'll be able to create viral loops uh by giving away value you'll be able to have people share it because they're getting value in this game uh but second it just comes to the fundamental goal of if you create a new way for publishers and, and game creators to monetize via incentive alignment. So building a long-term economy with say clips on secondary trades rather than just extracting value, then you're creating an environment where the types of games that are profitable for them to build are better for players. Uh, and I think that's actually a really needed change to, to some of the mobile industries. Um, but I also think there's this uh, really cool genre of games emerging where you know mobile has one of the biggest casual audiences in the world. And this can really be a massive funnel for onboarding people into Web3, into mobile wallets, into uh, having the experience of earning real value in order for, for playing these games. So I think it's going to be a huge channel in Web3. Do you have an elevator pitch for someone skeptical about NFTs, particularly in the gaming space? Some of us understand their utility, but relaying that to others has been more difficult. Yeah, I, I, one of the first things I say is how much would you pay for a house if you could never sell that house? And the concept of ownership is one that people are not used to in the digital space because we've been sold this lie since the invention of the internet that just because something is intangible means we shouldn't have property rights over it. And at the core of what we're doing today is we're inventing physics for the digital world. The reason you're able to own a house is because you physically have custody of that thing. We're inventing the same thing for the digital world. But the second thing is, I probably wouldn't pitch them at all. Mm -hmm. I'd probably just give them a game to play and let them enjoy that game and, and experience the value. And that's why I always say the way we take web new games mainstream is not by creating Twitter threads on, on why it's important. I mean, this is fine for industry insiders who want to talk about strategies. It is by creating games which people love, which are better for players, which have hundreds of millions of users, we have no idea what Web3 is under the surface. And that is the only thing that matters in taking it mainstream. How will the Ethereum merge affect Immutable, if at all? And did you have to do anything to prepare for it? So Ethereum merge will be fundamentally complementary to what we're building with Immutable. The first thing it will do is it's going to move Ethereum from being a proof of work blockchain to a proof of stake blockchain. 
And this means that the network will no longer be secured by miners, but instead by stakers. This has a few things. It makes the network more secure, more resistant to state-sponsored attacks, which is probably there's only two countries in the world which could afford to bring down Ethereum today. And after this, there'll be none uh, because they won't hold the, the staking balances required to, to make these attacks. And the third thing is it will reduce the new amount of Ethereum coming onto the market every day from over 10,000 today to less than 2,000. So Ethereum will likely become a permanently deflationary asset, not financial advice. And uh, the reason that this is so significant is it means that Ethereum as a capital asset is going to increase its network effects. The reason we decided to build on it rather than compete with it is we just wanted to make the decisions that would lead to better outcomes for the games building on us and, and the users trading on us. More value, more users, more network effects. And the second thing is that it won't actually impact scale. So uh, the, the necessity of layer twos and layer threes will still be there. And one of the examples I wanted to point out is if you look at bringing World of Warcraft or RuneScape on a blockchain today, even 10,000 transactions per second, which Immutable X is capable of achieving today in production. We recently did one of the largest production uh, mints ever for, for ApeCoin, where we minted 100,000 NFTs in 11 seconds. Uh, even this will not cater to 100 million players trading assets as they trade the gold or, or skins or, you know, goblin bones they just got by, by killing someone in Al Karit. And the, the reason this matters so much is it actually requires a fundamentally different architecture, which is what Immutable is building with our cross roll up liquidity platform. And this means we can have hundreds of L2s or L3s dedicated to a game if it needs. You know, um, Disney can have their own L3, Marvel can have their own L3. RuneScape, World of Warcraft can have their own dedicated 10,000 transactions per second. But all of these users and orders and funds can still be shared. So you'll be able to transact with your GameStop wallet on any one of these L3s without requiring centralized bridges, which has been over $2.5 billion of hacks on the last six months for. And so that's actually one of the key pieces. You know, I think this is going to be one of the most monumental shifts in um, the scaling space in since, since its invention. Uh, and that's what we're going to be launching at the end of this year slash quarter one next year. So really excited about that. Very cool. Um, can you explain the IMX tokenomics? What makes it unique? Yeah, so I, I think IMX is a really core cool part of the ecosystem. So first off, IMX has to be used in every single transaction that occurs on Immutable no matter where these occur. It could be in GameStop Wallet, GameStop Marketplace, inside the Illuvium in-game marketplace. And the really important thing is that 20% of uh, the, the fees required to pay for that transaction must be paid for in IMX. We swap this under hood, there's no friction to end users. Um, but th I think that's really, really key. The second thing is that there is almost zero supply uh, coming on the market um, from the grant side that is not Sort of underwritten by milestones so the foundation and, and immutable work together very closely where we have a, a full-time team of 10 plus people and tokens designing the right long-term incentive structures for, for a lot of these partnerships and as i said before we've, we've actually worked really hard to make sure that any supply that when these milestones uh, do come through the foundation is sort of found long-term buyers to match against um, the supply of those partners so our overall goal is how do we create a token where every single person who trades on Immutable, no matter where it is, can gain access to the token and can become part of essentially this mission to decentralize and empower players for Web3 gaming all across the world. Uh, and so check out the tokenomics portal for, for, for more detail. But the really unique thing is that every single time you trade on Immutable, no matter where it is, you're earning IMX as a reward. And this means that as we get 100 million players on the platform, a billion players on the platform, they all become part of this mission to say, hey, how do we create a better experience for Web3 games? Uh, and so that's one of the key things that I think I'm really excited about IMX as well. So I just have a question. Uh, so when people are trading in the GameStop marketplace, will they earn IMX that way too? Of course. So oh, any well. single trade occurring on the GameStop marketplace will actually be earning IMX under the hood. Um, so oh, yeah, cool. really, really excited about that. Yeah. Oh, um, awesome. And we actually recently uh, flipped Solana uh, for doing the most NFT volume in the world um, nice. after Ethereum L1. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. 
Uh, there's a lot of competition in the space. Why do you think Immutable is positioned to succeed? I think there's a few things. Uh, the, the main one is that we're, you know, we're built by gamers for the custom context of games. And games by far is the most lucrative segment of Web3. When you look at VC investments into Web3, the lion's share is going into Web3 gaming because people realize this is how it's going to go mainstream and this is where the most volume is going to come from. And that focus on gaming has actually been fundamental to every choice we've made. When we made the decision of what technology architecture do we build this on? You know, we, we chose zero knowledge rollups because we knew we never wanted to compromise users and security. Uh, we chose uh, non-custodial staking because we knew we never wanted to have a staking product which could be vulnerable or, or put users' assets at risk. We chose mainstream onboarding via things like emails or the GameStop wallet because we knew that we wanted to make it incredibly easy for anyone to play these games. And there's more work to be done here. I'm not saying that's perfect, but by far we're, we're industry leading today. Um, and I think that's actually been kind of at the core of everything we've done. Of course, we have 100 full-time people and way more on the contractor side working just on Immutable Studios. So building games, building the tokenomics of games and publishing games. And that means we have the greatest level of expertise out of any platform when it comes to games wanting to build. And that's actually a really, really key thing for us winning the deals that we do today. But just in summary, like our thesis is get more games, get more players, get more trading and reward everyone. And that's the core flywheel that is creating this, this engine of success where people can come on board the immutable platform, they can play our games, they can be becoming part of you know, the immutable mission, and then they can go and become evangelists to kind of win more games. Mm. Um, and recently, we literally hit the number two in the crypto slam charts after Ethereum layer one for NFT volume. And the most important thing is that all of our volume is not coming from collectibles, which are idiosyncratic, where they can be high one week and, and low the next. They're coming from the reasons people trade them are the number of players in the game and the reasons to trade in the game. And those are economies that are going to grow long term over time that we can constantly invest in. How does Immutable approach market volatility? What do you think about NFT price volatility, especially in games? Yeah, great question. So first thing to say is we were born into a bear market, right? The biggest bear market pretty much that crypto has ever had in, in 2018. And that was the best thing that ever happened to Immutable because it meant we had to develop a real product that users cared about, but there was actual value being delivered rather than harboring, you know, crazy incentives and tokenomics and hype uh, in a bull market. And I think it also meant we developed the financial discipline to really focus on building the right team rather than raising a bunch of money, probably too much for, for what most companies needed at certain stages and, and not really building the company thoughtfully and in the right way. And at the moment, you know, we have over four years of runway. Uh, we're in an incredibly strong position for, for this market and we're growing aggressively. We were 90 people at the start of the year. We're 300 now. We're going to be 360 by the end of the year. Uh, but you, you raised a great point, which is NFT prices and NFT volume. I think I mentioned this earlier on, but anything that is speculative will ultimately remain correlated to how much demand crypto has more broadly. And we are not interested in focusing on building platforms for those kinds of experiences. What we are focused on is how do we build long-term volume, which is decorrelated from the crypto market, which is just how do we make economies inside games real? I mean, gaming is you know, counter recessionary. People spend more time playing games when there's a recession. Net monetization remains roughly the same, but it is by far one of the most resilient industries. And right now gaming is growing like crazy. So as we increase, like the, the mission to make this stuff real is completely decorrelated to what the price of Ethereum is. The reason someone trades an asset on Immutable in the future should be because they want to buy, you know, a, a skin or a sword inside their favorite RPG, or they want to sell it because they just earned it from beating this autumn boss, uh, awesome boss. And I think that's really key to our approach to market volatility, which is that it actually should have nothing to do with the mission of our platform and the mission of what we're building long term. Okay, last question. Uh, what is Immutable's vision? So I think long term, all forms of unique value will turn into NFTs. What we've invented is the most powerful incentive alignment construct that's ever been created, a powerful form of the digital ownership, which is an absolute necessity as the entire world moves digital. But it's not just gaming. Houses will be traded as NFTs. Intellectual property will be traded as NFTs. We've already seen the greatest shift 
of creator empowerment and monetization in the history of the world, thanks to NFTs over the last three years. It's just been localized mainly to a few musicians and uh, artists. And we're going to see things like term deposits, of which there's a trillion dollars of outstanding liabilities in the world today, become tradable based on NFTs. eBay and StockX are doing non-custodial trading of their assets, very likely looking at NFTs. StockX has said this. And so any form of unique value in the world will ultimately be traded under the hood by this data standard of an NFT. It's not all going to happen at once. Real estate, for instance, is going to take decades because you have to work with 4,000 jurisdictions around the world. But some will happen very quickly. And the most important thing is, how do we make sure the platform which enables this actually empowers users, is actually better incentives and monetization for everyone involved rather than trying to charge 50% fees like Meta or crazy rent extractive business models like all of the incumbents? And how do we also make sure that it's decentralized and secure? And Immutable's mission is to connect the buyers and sellers of every single one of these traders. And, uh, you know, uh, purely speculative, but this is where a lot of these marketplaces could end up. You could easily see GameStop marketplace being the hub of, you know, uh, people trading term deposits or um, sneakers or some other kind of key form of value in the future. And I'm, I'm, that's not based on any specific knowledge, mm -hmm. but that's where we, we see the ultimate trend of, of this NFT trade going is it'll underpin the entire topology of, of how people exchange value in the world. And that's why we think it's by far the biggest emergent market since search. It will be trillions of dollars in value, but most importantly, it's trillions of dollars in value returned to customers, players, and users via better incentives, a better business model, and, and true digital ownership of stuff. Well, thank you. That's all the questions we have today. Uh, thank you for coming on again. Um, is there anything you would like to tell the SuperSong community? Yeah, I mean, a uh, it's it's always a pleasure interacting with you. I'm I'm pretty frequently dropping into the the Reddit. Uh, give us a follow on Twitter at Immutable or me at Zero X Ferg. Uh, we drop basically all of our, our alpha on games and, and gaming announcements that are going to be launching on game stuff on there. Come join our Discord or our Reddit, uh, and let me know if you have any other questions. I plan to keep this up pretty regularly. Uh, us and, and the GameStop team are working really closely together, both on this marketplace launch, but also on just longer term strategic growth on how we make them a core pillar of NFT into the future. Um, so thanks very much for having me and, and talk soon. Thank you.